Yes, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. I receive it. Yes. yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you will lift up your hands for the Lord. I pray this blessing and wherever you are, if you're at home, do the same. This is the blessing that God himself wrote the words to. It's, it's a, there's a power in it. He said, when you do this, you will place my name upon that. Yes. And this was given to the sons of Aaron. That's the house I'm from. So it's my blessing yes. to give it to you. Yes. It was given to God's people. You are the people of God. And God's will is to bless you. So here in the language of the Bible, the blessing. Yes. service of the refuge. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Woo! Did you just feel the waves of the glory of the Lord through that? Oh, just the waves of the glory. Now, you can find that on YouTube. If you just YouTube the Arianic Blessing, that will come up. Um, and I want to encourage you, listen to that every morning if you can. Because that's just starting out the morning with the blessing of the Lord. Is that not beautiful? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Yes, it is, absolutely. And, and what he basically did was he sang the Arianic blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. So he sang that in Hebrew first. Was that not beautiful in the Lord? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody bless the Lord in this place this morning. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we've got a two-part message today. Part one is going to be released this morning. Part two is going to be released at Pelly Road tonight. And I pray that you come tonight at 5 o'clock to Pelly because God's just going to do amazing things like he's been doing all morning long. Amen. In this house. Hallelujah. If you're not able to come, it'll be broadcast also. It'll be available on our website. Um, and in Facebook. So I just want to encourage you, just dive in because God has given me a message that is just burning upon my heart for this house and for his church in this hour. So are you ready to receive this morning? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And this morning, as we look at the logos, may we have hearts that seek the rhema of God. Amen. May we not just be a people that read the word, but may we meditate on the word and the Holy Spirit. Oh, and may we walk in the glory of the Lord as the Spirit of the living God releases logos to us. Amen. Through Rhema to us through the logos. Do you receive that today? Yes. Hallelujah. So, Lord Jesus, I just thank you today for the prophet Jeremiah who said, Lord, your word is like fire within my bones. If I don't let it out, God, it's just going to burn within me until I do. And Lord Jesus, I ask this morning and I ask this evening that you will release a fire and anointing within every one of us, Lord, to be a people that live a fasted and intercessory lifestyle. Lord, a people that live understanding that we're in the end times and for such a time as this you put us in our mother's wombs lord i thank you that we're a people of destiny because we were birthed by a god of destiny and the god of destiny and lord i declare an awakening today over this house i declare an awakening over the church in this region i declare an awakening over the church in the apostolic state of illinois i decree an awakening over the United States of America today. I decree an awakening over the nation of Israel. And I declare an awakening throughout the earth today in the name of Jesus. Well, the Lord is saying the time that you've been waiting for is here. The time that you've cried out to me for is here. The time has come where the reapers will catch up with those that are planting the seed. The Lord says the time is now for my church to arise in glory and honor and power in me. The Lord says now is the time for the bride to make herself ready. The Lord says now is the time of intimacy into to me see. The Lord says now is the time. Now is the hour. Wait no longer. It's time to move forward God says. The Lord says now is the time to become the church that I've created you to be in this hour. Do you receive that in the Lord today? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would release the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know Jesus more. Amen. We honor you, Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you have the word with you today, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And today we're going to talk about what God wants the end times church to look like. What God wants the end times church to look like. How many receive that in the Lord today? Amen. Hallelujah. The word says, how are they going to know unless someone teaches them? And the Lord is saying this morning that he wants to give us a vision of what the end times church is going to look like. And he says, hallelujah, if we can see it in the realm of the spirit, we can walk in it. Come on now. He says, if we can see it in the realm of the spirit, we can walk in it. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. I hear an amen. And he says, we're about to see things in the realm of the Spirit. How many know that it's your birthright to walk in the Spirit and to see in the Spirit realm through the power of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Come on now. Amen. Hallelujah. 
You will and receive that in the Lord. Okay, God says it's time for us to get beyond ourselves, the things that we've known, to get beyond our flesh, and to begin to walk in the realm of the Spirit like yes. never before. Yes. Because I'm convinced in the Lord that you are so much more amazing in the Lord than what you realize. Yes. And God says, I'm bringing you out of orphanness and into sonship. He says, I'm bringing you through sonship and into brideship. And He says, I'm bringing you through brideship into my glory. Yes. Do you receive that in Him? Yes. Amen. The Lord is saying it's time. It's time to put off the ways of childishness and walk in the ways of maturity in the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's stand to honor the Word of God. Amen. We don't stand religiously, but we just stand because Jesus is the Word made flesh. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. So the Word says this. As for you. Hallelujah. Somebody say, as for me. As for me. Hallelujah. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Okay, maybe that was just me. Maybe that was nobody else in the room. Nope. You know, maybe you were born loving Jesus right out of the womb. But I walked in some stuff. Amen? But how do you know the word says, but they overcame him through the blood of the lamb and the power of the testimony. Yeah. If you walked in some stuff, then God brought you through some stuff. Amen. And, amen? and he's bringing you through some stuff. Amen. And it's so amazing when things haven't turned out exactly the way we thought they were at this point. But the Lord says, my plan for you has never changed. Amen. And the Lord says, I have an amazing end times calling on your life. Yes. Yes. And I heard the Lord saying, I'm going to use that little baby girl for my glory. Yes. The Lord says, no life is a mistake. She was planned by me. And the Lord said, even though you said, Lord, I'm not ready for this. The Lord says, I've made you ready. The Lord says, I've anointed you. But the Lord says, I have a ministry for you. What man says disqualifies you God says I need to qualify you so God says don't let go of the dreams I put in your heart God says I am my hand is upon you and my will is going to prosper in your hand God says it doesn't matter what man says God says I'm directing your steps amen you receive that woman of God amen hallelujah so the word says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following the desires, its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But... Somebody say, but God. but God. But because of his great love for us, God, mm, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Jesus Christ, even when we were dead in, in transgressions, and it is by grace you've been saved. <laughs> and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And that is not from ourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do before the foundations of the world were laid. Somebody say amen. amen. Please be seated this morning. You know, the Lord has really been putting on my heart the topic of what the end times church looks like. Has God been speaking to anyone about that also? Because God has been saying to me, the end times church is going to look nothing like what the world has ever seen. And the exciting thing about that is you are part of the end times church. I want you to get a revelation today. God could have birthed you at any point in history. He chose to birth you at this time. Has anybody received that in the Lord? Amen. My daughter ran relay races for her high school two years ago before COVID hit. 
and there were four rounds of this relay race and the coach would save the strongest runner for the last lap of the relay. Come on. And the strongest runner would receive the baton and run with it with all of his or her might to win the race. The Lord is saying he has saved his anchors, his strongest runners for such a time as this. And he's saying crouch down and grab the baton of the previous generations. And as you lift it up to run, lift it up to heaven, and I will fill it with my glory and shift it into my end times baton and then run with all your might and finish this race. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Does anybody receive that in the Lord this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's take a look at this morning in this passage in Ephesians chapter 2. You know, I'm convinced this morning that the epistles were written for the end times church. How many received that in the Lord? I really believe that, that the gospels were written for unredeemed Israel and for the Gentiles. But I believe that the epistles were written for the end times people of God. Do you receive that in the Lord? And so I believe that God wants us to look as the end times people at the epistles because they provide a roadmap for us of how God wants us to live in this age. Are you receiving that in the Lord? So we've got to understand this as God's people. The church was birthed at the cross, was anointed by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then given the epistles by Paul to understand how we're to live out the call of the Lord in the end days. I really believe that in him. And I want you to notice something here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. I truly believe this morning, if we understand what the word says, the word reveals to us that the unbeliever isn't sick, they're actually dead. So we've got to understand that. Dead in their trespasses and in their sins. My daughter and her generation, she's 16, got caught up in some weird thing called the zombie apocalypse. Okay? The zombie apocalypse. And, and I really believe if we truly understood spiritually what's going on around us in the world, we're surrounded by zombies. What do I mean by that? Their body and their soul, but their spirit's not alive. So they're the walking dead. We've got to understand this. See, when we're saved... Our spirit man comes to life and we're truly tripartite. We walk as spirit, soul, and body, a reflection of the God who created us, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now the Lord wants us to surrender our spirit, soul, and body to Him and go through the process of sanctification so He can get the us out of us so we can begin to walk the way that Jesus walked here on earth. How many that? Hallelujah. We've got to understand this. So we've got to understand the dead in the world, they don't need resuscitation, they need resurrection. Amen. How many received that in the Lord? Amen. Pastor Sidney, can you give us John eleven twenty five? We've got to realize something. When we walk out of this house, we walk into the mission field that God has for us. And when we walk into the mission field that God has for us, Jesus walks with us. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And we've got to get a revelation of what he says in John eleven twenty five. 25. What does he say? Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So we're surrounded by the walking dead. But as we walk through them, we walk through them with he that is the resurrection and the life. Amen. The Lord Jesus loves to take that which is dead and bring it back to life again. Yes. And there's a word in that, not only for the lost, but also for the saved today. Because the Lord is saying in this room... And the, with the folks that are listening in in our virtual congregation, and the Lord says, and folks that are in the congregations right now throughout the earth receiving the word of the Lord, the Lord is saying 
There are dreams, there are visions, there are prophetic words that have been spoken over God's people, but because they seemingly have been delayed, you believe that they were dead. But the Lord says, I'm the resurrection and the life, and I'm bringing to life the anointings and the callings that have spoken over you. He says, does my word not say that I'm not slow in keeping my promises? I'm carefully watching over my word to fulfill it. And if we think God has been carefully watching over his word in previous generations, God is watching over his word now more than ever. Yes. Why? Because the time is short and there's an urgency in the realm of the spirit to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. And we're going to do it through the power of the one who is the resurrector and can bring the dead to life. Yeah. But we can't forget as the end times church in the midst of all of this, he says, remember, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Does anybody receive that in the Lord today? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So it's the power of the resurrection of Jesus that brings things back to life that were once dead. And God wants to put an anointing in the end times church to walk amongst the dead and see them resurrect. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Hallelujah. Remembering that all sinners are dead, but we're calling them back to life. You know, it's interesting as the church, we, we, we kind of try to figure out levels of sin. Well, you know, this sin is not as bad as this sin, and this doesn't grieve God as much as this grieves God. How many know the truth is all sin grieves God, period? Amen? And that's the truth, and we've got to understand this. All sinners are dead. The only difference between them is the state of decay. <laughs> we just got to understand that, right? But the Lord says nobody that's breathing is beyond his power, his anointing, his calling. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Some of them in the world appear to be different, but no corpse is different one from the other. I mean, we just got to understand that in the Lord. So what is God wanting us to do in this hour? He's wanting us to realize we have a kingdom birthright. See, God is going to bring the end time church into a greater revelation of who she is than any church has ever had in prior ages. Amen. See, part of the problem we have is, is that the enemy has tried to steal the identity of the church. Is anybody willing to receive that? He's tried to steal the identity of the church. And he started doing it right after the apostles began walking in the power that Jesus said they would. See, they were walking in signs, wonders, and miracles. They were doing greater things than what Jesus did. And, and you want evidence of that? Look at the life of Peter. Well, what do you mean by that? I see in the Word that Jesus healed the eyes of the blind. That He opened the deaf, the ears of the deaf. Can I hear an amen? amen? Hallelujah. That He set the captives free. But I don't read in the Word that his very shadow fell on people and they were healed. Yes. But yet Peter walked in such an anointing to do greater things than what Jesus did, his shadow would bring healing to people. Wow. Yeah. And the Lord says, my church is coming out of the shadows. They're coming out of the hiding places. And they're going to begin walking in my glory. And even their shadow will contain an anointing that's going to bring healing to people's lives. But you see, as the apostles began walking in the true apostolic, the enemy said, wait a minute, there's a problem here. I mean, this is going to shut down everything that I've got planned. So he brought in this doctrine of cessationalism. He brought in this doctrine of dispensation. This doctrine that states, you know, after that original group of apostles went in the grave, you know, that, that stuff was kind of done at that point. And generation after generation has believed that. They believed that healing wasn't for today and miracles weren't for today and the prophetic wasn't for today. But the, all of that is all over the epistles and the epistles are the letters to guide us as the end times church. They're full of healings. They're full of miracles. They're full of the power of God. And the Lord says, I want to set you free from what you've learned up to this point that was man's teaching, but not my teaching. And the Lord says, I'm now going to teach you according to my word. 
concept upon concept, precept upon precept. Come, let us reason together because God says, I'm about to show you great and mighty things that you don't know. He says, this is in Jeremiah 33, 33, 3 season. Call upon me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know. Hallelujah. Do you receive that in the Lord? Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. It's time to move forward and not backward. Somebody in the house today said to me, Pastor, that's water under the bridge. Talking about some a battle that I've been in. And you know what God's saying to you right now? These things you've worried with and you've struggled with and have held on to you. He said, I'm releasing an anointing over you that breaks the yoke. Let it go. It's water under the bridge. Man may try to hold it against you, but man likes to go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. But the Lord says, when I cast in the sea of forgetfulness, I've forgotten it. He says, I've redeemed you from the past and I'm taking away the shame of your youth. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. That young man will fulfill the Lord's purpose. Hallelujah. So I'm convinced that the enemy has tried to hide the birthright from the church. Yes, see, you've got a birthright to see in the spirit realm. You've got a birthright to walk in the anointing of God. You have a birthright to do greater things than what Jesus did. You have a birthright. Can I hear an amen in the Lord? Yeah. Why? Because you're no longer slaves. You're sons of the living God. And God said, you're about to receive a revelation of the covenant like you've never walked in before. Amen. Thank you, woman of God. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. Amen. See, I'm convinced that God wants to deliver the Gentile church from the Greek mindsets and bring us into the Hebrew mindsets. I'm convinced of that in the Lord. Why? Because it's going to change the entire way that we look at the Word. Amen. See, we've got to understand that. As Gentile believers, we believe that the Lord took the old covenant and destroyed it and created a completely new covenant. True covenant thinking is Hebrew thinking. And in the Hebrew thinking, a covenant has no end. Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Come on. We've got to understand that. See, we've got to understand Jesus didn't destroy the old covenant. He built upon it. Yes. He built upon it. Because to destroy it would have been to say that God made a mistake. Right. No. See, we've got to understand the new covenant opened up the door. The old covenant opened up the door for the new covenant. Right. Why? Because we could never live up to the terms of the old covenant. Yes. Right. We could never, because what did Jesus say? If you've broken one of the commandments, you've broken them all. And the Lord knew that man wasn't going to be able to keep the old covenant, the laws, the rules, the regulations. And that was going to cause a need for Jesus to come. Jesus is the new covenant. Jesus is the covenant. Can I hear an amen? So Jesus came. We've got to get our thinking right as the son of man and the son of God. Daniel 7, and I saw one come before the ancient of days that looked like the Son of Man, and he was given a kingdom that will never end. And every tribe, nation, and tongue will worship him. Amen. Jesus was the Son of Man. That was his favorite title for himself, and the Son of God. Why both? Because as the Son of Man, he could, feel, could fulfill the man side of the new covenant. And as the Son of God, He can fulfill the God side of the new covenant. Is anybody getting that? Because a covenant has an initiator and a recipient, and both have their responsibility. Come on now. When a man and a woman get saved, they're get married, they're entering into a covenant relationship. The man initiates, the woman receives, and everything that belongs to the man, once the covenant is initiated, now belongs to her also. Grab a hold of this revelation. Jesus is the bridegroom and we're the bride. He's initiated a covenant. When we step into that covenant, the word says it brings glory to Jesus when the Holy Spirit takes from Jesus what the Father gave to him and gives it to us. Amen. 
Do you get that revelation? Yes. That's why the old covenant was about what we did. The new covenant's about what Jesus did. Come on now. The old covenant had a lot of striving. The new covenant is about abiding. The old covenant was a visitation. The new covenant is habitation. Is anybody catching that? And a lot of people in the church today have an old covenant mindset. What do I mean? I've got to do, 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 do. The new covenant mindset is, no, I need to receive and walk in what Jesus did. Yes, that's Does that make sense? Yes, Hallelujah. And in that, I will be a hearer of the word and a doer. Through intimacy with him, I will hear the word and that word will activate in me and I'll walk in it. See the new, oh, you see the church that God is raising up in this hour is like nothing the world has ever seen before. And you are a part of that. And God is about to release revelation from His Word that no other generation has ever received. The Lord had He seen. Why? Because He saves the best wine for last. He said, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Amen. Meaning what? There is end times rhema that the church desperately needs to be able to use to overcome the enemy in the end times and establish the Lord's kingdom here on earth that God is now beginning to reveal that no other generation has ever seen before. He's the God of the appointed times and the appointed seasons. And he says, my church is coming into the final appointed season. And the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. Do you receive that in the Lord? Hallelujah. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. You are coming into a revelatory knowledge of your covenant relationship with Jesus. And that's going to change everything. Because I'm convinced when we fully understand the covenant and receive revelation of the covenant, we become a transformed people. Not just saved, but transformed. Because there's a lot of people out there that are saved, but not transformed. Come on now. So what is God saying? He says, to those who believe, I've given the power to become the children of God. But he says, you're going to transition from childhood into sonship. See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. It's a process, God says. Everything in the kingdom is a process. Somebody say process. process. See, we get saved and salvation is just entering into the door. I grew up in the Baptist realm. We believe if folks could get saved, I mean, that was it. That was it. They prayed the sinner's prayer. They have fulfilled their purpose. If that was the truth, when I baptized you, I'd just hold you under the water and keep you there until you expired. He's saved. His purpose is fulfilled. No, we've got to understand that when we're saved, it's only the beginning. You're given a wedding dress and a pair of combat boots when you're saved. And God says it's time for the church to start acting like it. 200 years ago, C.S. Lewis said, when is the church going to realize that the earth is not a playground, it's a battleground? How did he see the church in my generation? How do you look forward and see that? No, see, the way the church was in his generation is the same mindset we're battling in the church right now. There's two churches. There's the mainstream church and there's the remnant church. And the Lord says, I'm calling my remnant out. You see, when, when we're saved, wouldn't it be wonderful if everything that we needed was done completely at salvation? All the healing we needed, all the deliverance we needed, all the restoration we needed. But most of us are like onions. God's got to do some peeling. Those layers got to die. And he's got to pull those layers off. Can I hear an amen? amen. So we get saved and we enter into the kingdom and, and we're servants of God. Come on now. We're, we're servants of God. We just want to serve him. We just want to do his will. We just want to honor him. We're in the honeymoon phase. It's servants, servants, servants. Come on now. But the Lord says, I want you to not stay in that place of just being a servant. 
Because a servant doesn't have an inheritance in his father's household. He says, I want you to go from servant to sonship. Yes. And as you come into sonship, he says, you are going to begin to realize everything that I have for you in my covenants. Then he says, as you walk in that sonship, you are being sanctified in the process. Then he says, I want you to go from son to bride. I want you to realize you are my bride here on earth. Then he says, I want you to go from brideship to glory. Yes. Hallelujah. To walk in my glory and be my glorious bride without spot and without wrinkle. Can I hear an amen? It's a process. Where are you at in the process? If you're at the process of servant, God wants to bring you into sonship. If you're at sonship, he wants to bring you into the place of being the bride. If you're at the place of being the bride, he wants to bring you into the glory. There's nothing about the kingdom that's sedimentary. The kingdom moves forward. You receive that in the Lord? The kingdom moves forward. Your eyes look forward. Your hands grasp forward. Your feet point forward. God was trying to give you a message. Do you receive that in the Lord? There's only one part of your anatomy that points towards the past, and look what comes out of it. So you know what the Lord is saying? You can laugh at that. It's okay. Don't act like we're all completely sanctified here. You can laugh at that. But here's the thing. God says, leave the past behind you and stretch towards my high calling. Can I hear an amen? So God says, I have shifted you. You just don't realize it yet. Can I say that again? God says, I've shifted you. You just don't realize it yet. But you're going to catch up to my shifting. Do you know any prophetic word that you're ever going to come into, and you are coming into, or you have come into, was breathed by the Spirit of God at the throne of God first. Do you know when it was breathed? It was breathed before you were ever born. Amen. Because the word says in Ephesians 2, there's good works that he's to proclaim, set up, declared that we would do when? From the foundations of the world. Do you receive that in the Lord? So when you come into a prophetic word and that thing comes into fruition, you're coming into fruition of a word that was spoken in eternity past, wow. brought into eternity present, Release through the mouth of God's prophets or directly from the Holy Spirit into you and you caught up with the word that was spoken before you were ever born written about you in the book God wrote about your life and now you're coming into the fruition of it and there are words God's spoken over you that you have yet to catch up to but you are catching up to them in the name of Jesus do you receive that in the Lord? You are a Kairos people in the Lord. Do you receive that? Amen. Let's go to Revelation 17. We're talking about what the end times church looks like. Are you receiving in the Lord this morning? Now I'll have people come to me and I want you to please lay hold of this in the Lord. It ties into last week. And I want you to understand this. People will ask me, they'll say, Pastor, is America Babylon the Great? Because you look at what's going on in our nation right now. And people are going, Pastor, are we in that place of Babylon the Great right now as a nation? We've got to understand the times that we're in. Come on now. You, need, mm, you are going to walk in the Issachar anointing in this season. When David was in his desert stronghold, God sent men to him from all the tribes. And the word says, and the men of Issachar came, and they understood the times, and they understood the seasons, and they understood God's call on their life. In the name of Jesus, you're coming into an Issachar anointing. Yeah. You're coming into that anointing in the Lord. I declare God's releasing that over you right now. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. So we've got to understand the times. Can I hear an amen? amen? We can go to Matthew 24. We can go to Revelation 17. The signs of the times are all over the word of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. Now, we've got to understand in the Lord. We are entering into a new season. Grab a hold of this thought. 
not a season of peace and safety, but a season of powerful breakthrough. Yeah. <clears throat> and in this new season that we're coming into, we've got to throw out this thought process that everything should feel peaceful. You know what? We're coming into some great battles. Yeah. And battles don't always feel good. But the Lord says, I'm bringing an anointing of breakthrough that's going to change everything. Amen. See, we as the body of Christ have got to get out of this feeling mindset. We're Westerners. We're left-brainers. We've got to understand this. And how does it feel? Well, it just, it just didn't feel the same today. Well, I just didn't feel this today. Well, I just didn't feel that today. How many know every service you come to, God is there? Yeah. No matter how yeah. you feel, we've got to press in. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, when I walk in the room and God's not moving, I move him. I used to think that was arrogant until I realized he realized every time he came into a room, God was there and God wanted to do something. Did you receive that in the Lord? What did Jesus say? I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. We've got to let go of this how does it feel and start walking by faith and not by sight. Because some things that are coming that aren't going to feel really good, but God's all over them. Amen? All right. Notice what the word says in verse in, in set the whew, sight of the Lord. Revelation 17, 1. One of the angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitutes who sits on many waters. You know that word prostitute is interesting, and we don't like to use it in church, but Jesus is more real than we realize. Yes. And when we think prostitute, many times we think of the person standing on the corner. Okay. Can I be honest with you? Yes. Do you know there's something called spiritual prostitution? Yes. You know what the yes. Lord said to me one day? He said, Andrew, I'm tired of my church treating me like a prostitute. Okay. And I said, okay, God, I'm already convicted, and I don't even know exactly what you're trying to say. But I just feel conviction. I said, can you help me understand? And Holy Spirit said, <laughs> he said, can I just be real with you? Yes. I mean, we need to be real from the pulpit. Yeah. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, when, when, when someone's with a prostitute, they go and they pick them up, they go and they get their needs met, and then they drop them off. The Lord says, my church does that to me. Yeah. Wow. So they come to church to get the feeling they want, and then they leave me there and go home. Yeah. And the Lord says, I'm not a prostitute, I'm your bridegroom. Wow. Wow. And I went, Lord, and I got on my face before God. Yeah. See, why is the Lord speaking like that? Because he's coming back as the king. Yes. Right now, he's trying to teach us how to be his bride yes. so that we can receive him as our king. There's a transition going on in the spirit realm right now. He is coming into that season of the kingship that he needs to walk in to return as the victorious warrior on the, woo, hallelujah, on the white horse with the name on his thigh that only he knows with a double-edged sword. He came as a baby, but he's returning as the conquering king, and all the world will see him. But before the world sees him, he wants his people to see him for who he really is. So when we talk about prostitution, we can't just look at 7th Street or Broadway or wherever. we got to look at the church. Lord, are we prostituting you? Lord, have we walked like Babylon the Great? Well, what is Babylon the Great? Well, notice what the word says. Verse 2. With her, or with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. You know what's interesting? The word says we're a royal priesthood. When the word says that he's the king of kings, who do you think are the kings that he's the king of? Us. And what does the word say? The kings of the earth commit adultery with her. So that adultery hasn't gone on only in the world. It's gone on in the church. What's adultery? When we are married to the king, but our heart also is given to other lovers. 
The Lord said of Israel at one point in their history in the Old Testament, the Lord says that they worship Jehovah and other gods. And the Lord says, I'm a jealous God. I'll no longer share my wife with other lovers. That's what God, God is speaking to the church. Well, Pastor, I came from an encouraging message. I'd rather, like, I'd rather give you a real message from the Spirit of God. Amen? amen. Because God's going to talk to me about whether or not I preach this to you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Notice verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the Spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, that's normally the colors of royalty, and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. See, she is the great masquerader. We've got to understand that in the Lord. Not everything that glitters is gold. Church of God, we need to walk in discernment in the end times. And not everything sometimes we say is of the Holy Spirit is of the Holy Spirit. We've got to talk to Holy Spirits and find out what's of Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? Amen. All right. And the word says, she held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries and the titles written on her forehead, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. And when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then... Uh, then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? <laughs> and I think the Lord is saying that to the church right now. Why are you astonished? Astonished with what? The things going on in America today. The things going on in our schools today. The things going on in society today. Why are you astonished? These things must happen. But Daniel said in the midst of this, there's a people who know their God and they'll do mighty exploits. That's the end times church throwing off oh, the chains of religion and walking in the power of God. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. Here's what we need to understand. Revelation 17, 1 to 7. Babylon the Great is not a political system. Babylon the Great is not a financial system. Babylon the Great is a religious system. That's what we need to understand. And so when people ask me, Pastor, is America Babylon the Great? I don't think America is Babylon the Great as much as the church has been. And I know I'm not going to get a single amen on that one. Amen. But Babylon the Great is a religious system. Any church participating in the religious system runs the risk of walking in that place of prostitution. Very quiet in the house. Revelation doesn't always make you say amen. So it's either amen or oh no. Do you receive that in the Lord? And then this is an oh no. <laughs> See, we've got to understand this in the Lord. So what does God say about this religious system? Pastor Cindy, can you give us 2 Corinthians 6.17? See, this is not going to be an easy message today, but it's a message God wants us to hear. Can I hear an amen? amen? What's God's answer to the religious system of Babylon? It's on the screen right now. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing, and I will receive you. Right now, if we could see the mainline church in America in the spirit realm, we would see a crack coming down the middle, and out of that crack, crack is coming a remnant that's coming out of her. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Now I want you to think about this. God wants to make Eve for Adam. Eve is going to be Adam's bride. Can I hear an amen? amen. God puts Adam to sleep and does not take Adam's entire body. He takes only a rib. And he makes the bride out of it. Get this revelation. Jesus is not coming back for the entire bride or the entire body. 
He's coming back for the bride. The picture of Adam and God taking the rib and making Eve was a prophetic picture all the way at the beginning for what God was going to do at the end. It started with a bride and it ends with a bride. See, we've got to understand that. Why is the Lord coming back for the bride? Because the bride is the one who makes herself ready. And let me ask you a question. How many in the church are making themselves ready as opposed to those that are building houses and planting vineyards and asking like and acting like God's not going to come back in our generation? Come on, that's good. The bride is the one making herself ready. So what is God saying to the remnant? Come out from above them! Now, let me qualify what I just said with this. Some of the remnant dwells in the midst of the mainstream church. God has her there as missionaries to show them what God is wanting to do. And you may be a remnant missionary to some people that go to different churches, provoking them in the Lord, in the Lord to what they could be walking in. If they really wanted to step out and have that remnant heart. Yes. See, being the remnant is a heart condition. Yes. It's not where you're sitting in a pew. It's a heart condition. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. But there is a remnant church. Do not get me wrong with that. Well, Pastor, are you preaching that the refuge is the remnant church? No, I'm preaching we're part of the remnants. We're part of a movement of God. Yes. Amen? Right now, all over this region, there are churches meeting, and within those churches, there are remnant hearts. And there are mainstream hearts. God is saying, come out of the system of religion, is what he's saying. Come out from among them and be separate. That word separate can also be translated in the Greek set apart. Set apart means holy. He's saying come out from among them and be separate. Be set apart. Be holy. Be single heartedly devoted to me, God saying. Do you receive that in the Lord? The Lord's saying it's time from going from worshiping Jehovah and other gods. To only worshiping the Lord our God and being single-heartedly devoted to Him. Come out from among them, God says. Does that make sense for anybody out there? Amen. What's He really saying? Come out from among them and be set apart for Jesus. That's what the Lord is saying in this hour. Come out from among them and be pure. I want you to notice Isaiah 52.11. Pastor Cindy, can you give this to us today? Isaiah 52, 11. Stay with this word today. Stay with the, the holy prophetic strength God is pouring out to us today. What does the Lord say? He says, depart, depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure. You who carry the articles of the Lord's house. I'm going to argue you carry the articles of the Lord's house with you. Wow. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that when we get together on Sunday morning, it's to celebrate everything that God's been doing in your life all week long. Yeah. It's not your time to come to the feeding trough and get fed for the week. Yeah. It's when you're, you're celebrating everything that God's done all week long. And I'm going to argue we, we walk out of here like this. Because we're carriers of the articles of the Lord. We're carrying His holy light with us. We're carrying His holy communion with us. We're walking out of here like this into a mission field filled with the walking dead. We who carry the articles of the Lord touch no unclean thing. Isn't that a picture? By the way, that's not in my notes. Holy Spirit just said to do that. See, he said, I'm going to teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. And he says, I'm doing that in your life right now if you're willing. See, we've got to understand this. I believe we're at the beginning of the last great awakening. Yeah. Connie was mentioning that the moment she got in the van today. It was already in my notes. She's like, we're, 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 we're the, the, the great awakening. It's happening right now. It's the last great awakening. And God has chosen you to be revivalists yeah. in the last great awakening. Yeah. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. Do you receive that? 
What are going to be the three predominant elements of those that walk in the last great awakening? Holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. Holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. Solomon said the fear of the Lord is just the beginning of wisdom. See, if we're going to walk in this great end times revival, you know what the Lord says? He says, I'm jealous and I want to get the mixture out of my church. He says, to a people without mixture, I'll pour out my power beyond measure. Do you receive that? So what's going on in the remnant heart right now? God's purifying the remnant heart. He's saying, I'm pulling out of you the worship of other gods. I'm, I'm cleansing out of you the love of other lovers. Right now, I'm setting you free from the shame of your youth. God says, I'm bringing you into a deeper place of holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. The Lord says, I'm preparing you for the last great end times work. God would say to Israel before they went into a major battle, the Lord would say, purify yourselves. We're heading into the last great battle. Purify yourself. How do we do that? Through the washing of the word. How do we do that? Hallelujah, through fasting. How do we do that? Through pursuing the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? By allowing the Holy Spirit to take us by the hand through the process of sanctifying. Because the Lord says the church is too alive. He says, I want her to die so that she can live. He said, unless a seed goes in the ground and dies, it can do nothing. But if it'll go on the ground and die, it will bring forth a harvest. God wants to bring forth a hundredfold harvest through you. The Lord said some seeds will produce 30, 60, hundredfold. I declare your hundredfold producers in the name of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen. Woo! Do you receive that in the Lord today? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So we've got to understand we are coming into the great end times revival at the end of the age. And I'm going to say this in love. The things that we've done in the past that have worked, don't be surprised if they don't work anymore. Right, daughter? Don't be surprised if they don't work anymore. God says, don't keep coming before me the way that you always have. I'm doing a new thing. And the Lord says, maybe if you're quiet and you're, you're frustrated and you're quiet times with me right now, it's because you're coming before me the same way you've always have. It's worked in previous seasons, but I'm doing a new thing now. Moses passes away. Joshua is at a swollen, flooded Jordan River. And God's about to use him to bring forth great victory in the promised land. And the priests have the ark. And he says, tell the priest to set foot in the river. Joshua, I'm about to take you by a way you've never been before. Amen. So I want you to get this. Moses raises his staff and God parts the Red Sea. Joshua has the priest carry the ark. And the Jordan parts. Two completely different things. How many know that Joshua could have stood there with Aaron, with Moses' staff all day long in front of the Jordan River? And the river would have just kept on going. <laughs> but it worked before. That echoes in eternity. It worked before, 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 before. before. And God echoes back. I'm doing a new thing. thing, 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 thing. <laughs> and so many in the church are standing at the Jordan with Moses' rod and they're going, Part! <laughs> and that river is just still flowing. And they're going, But God, what's happening? And God says, I'm doing a new thing. Stop doing what you've always been doing. I may bring you in your quiet time and say, I want you to start praising and worshiping me first. He may say, I want you to go walk in the middle of the forest preserve, hallelujah, and, and worship me. God, God wants to switch things up. The things that worked decades ago aren't going to work anymore. He's doing a new thing. He's the author and the finisher. Let's let him offer and finish. Can I hear an amen? amen? So God says, stop thinking all these old things are going to work. He says, I'm putting new wine into new wine skins. Yeah. Remnant, folks that have a remnant heart have a new wine skin in their spirits. 
Does that make sense? Well, I don't understand. That song used to be so anointed when we sang it. <laughs> well, you know what? Right now, God's releasing songs from the third heaven. You can pick up that old wine skin all service long if you want to. But I'm going to drink from the new wine skin. Amen? God says, I'm doing a new thing. And that's not about the young generation. That's for every generation. The new wine skin, it's a heart condition. It's not a... a youth condition. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. Amen. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. So what's God telling his church, his remnant church? Come out of the religious system of Babylon and be my covenant people at the end of the age. Yes. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yes. All right. So I want you to think about something now. Because to understand where we're going, we've got to understand where we've been. See, we've got to understand it. Not that we're going to do the things that used to be done, but we've got to have an understanding of what's been. You know, when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, they put the spear in his side and blood and water flowed. You ever read that before? Yes. Okay. Blood and water flows at a birthing. That's when blood and water flows. See, I'm convinced that just as God took Eve from Adam's side, when the spear was put into Jesus' side, the church, Jesus' bride, came out of him. See, I'm going to argue when, when God put Adam in the garden, he put Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve was in Adam. God just took her out. That's a prophetic picture. At the cross, the church came forth out of Jesus' side. And we who are at his side in eternity past will be at his side again in eternity future. See, we've got to understand he's the God of the full circle. We've got to get this thing, amen? Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Now, I want you to grab a hold of this. What did they do in the New Testament church? It was simple what they did. They... Mm. They heard the gospel preached and they received it. Amen. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out and they shared everything that they received flowing in the power of the king and his kingdom. Amen. It was that simple. And to them, a church was not a building. They were the church. So I'm going to say it again. We don't go to church. We are the church. Yeah. We're the, the ecclesia. We're the called out ones. Yes. This is a celebration. We walk out of here carrying the articles of the Lord. Does that make sense? I mean, this is a prophetic picture for you. Israel's coming up out of Egypt and they said, ask your neighbors for all their silver and gold. All their precious treasures. Israel walks out of Egypt with payment for 400 years of slavery. The Lord says, my people are walking out of Babylon the great, filled with riches. <laughs> because I'm going to give them everything that Babylon the great was supposed to be using for my kingdom, but hasn't. Does anybody get that? The Lord's restoring back what the enemy has stolen. What the locusts and canker worm have eaten. God is restoring that back to his kingdom. He's also restoring back what religion has stolen from us. I mean, I'm a pastor's kid. There's, there's, there's four generations of pastors in my family. Great, great grandpa Shambach, the German fellow, hears the voice of God while he's farming, gets off his equipment, receives Jesus as Savior. A few weeks later, hears the voice of God again in the field, gets in the dirt of the field, surrenders to ministry, and he's a circuit-riding pastor the rest of his life back in the hills of Missouri. In the next three generations, there's ten pastors. This God invading a family line and restoring back what the enemy has stolen. Do you want an encouraging word from the Lord today? It's the heart of God that every generation's anointing be poured out in double dose on the next generation. It's Elijah to Elisha. That's a spiritual principle. God said you are going to receive the double dose of the double dose of the double dose of what your ancestors should have walked in. You're going to receive that, God said. Mm. Do you receive that in the Lord today? 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So what is God saying? God says my church is about to return to its roots. But it's going to produce a different fruit than the world has ever wow. seen before. Wow. So we've got to understand this. When did we go from the power and anointing of the apostles and uh, shadows healing people to believing that this stuff wasn't for today? When in the world did this happen? When did we, when, when did we believe a bill of goods? Well, I tell you what, church, it happened because of Rome. There was Nero, who was a great persecutor of Christians. There was the next emperor, who was a great persecutor of Christians. And you know what happened under the persecution of Rome to the New Testament church? The church exploded. And I'm going to say this in love because I made a statement a little bit ago that I think was hard to receive. The Lord says this new season is not necessarily going to be a season of peace. Yeah, not necessarily is it always going to feel safe. But he says it's going to be a season of power. See, when the church is under persecution, the real remnant comes out and powerful things happen. When you're a church because, under the threat of retaliation and punishment, you're there because you're hungry for Jesus. I'm telling you, folks. And you start looking at what God's doing in underground churches all over the world. They're seeing signs, wonders, miracles, incredible things. Because to come to church is a risk. So they come to church because they're crazy about Jesus. And some pastors only have one page of the Bible. And they preach for years from one page of the Bible. So they've got to seek the Lord for fresh rhema every week on the same page they've been preaching from for years. And the Holy Spirit always does that. Amen. See, this is powerful things God's doing in the remnant. So you know what happened? They had these persecutors from Rome that persecuted the way, and the way exploded. So the enemy goes, hmm, that's not working. This is not having the effect that I want. So I'm going to raise up and tell me if any of this description is going to become familiar to you. I am raising up a uniter. And that uniter is going to unite the kingdom under the banner of unity, common thought, and common religion. His name was Constantine. And Constantine took all of the religions of the Roman kingdom and balled them into one. He created a religion that was not offensive, that had elements that everybody could lay hold of, and it completely caused the church to be watered down. He made Christianity the national religion. And what was thought to be a wonderful thing destroyed what we knew as the church. And in fact, I'm going to say this in love, there's many traditions in the church that we follow today that came out of Constantine's temple worship. See, he instituted temple worship into the church. Prior to Constantine, the church was never viewed as a building. When Paul wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus, he was writing it to a group of people, not an address. See, we've got to understand that. We've got to get that. But Constantine associated worship with the temple and so now all of the Gentile believers who didn't understand the temple worship system of Israel now went, oh, this is how it's supposed to work. Now it was assumed you connected with God at the temple because that's kind of where he lived. And that was it. And that began to change everything. And that's when the church began to be watered down. And in the church today, when we celebrate days like Easter... That came right out of Constantine's pagan, united religion worship. Even the way we view Christmas is not biblical in a lot of ways. And it comes from Constantine. Anybody kind of going, hmm. But you know what Constantine really did to shut down the signs, wonders, and miracles, whether he realized or not he was doing it? He took the power and he gave it to the priests. And he said, the ones that are in the position of priests are the ones that should read the word, 
prophesy the word, release the word, walk in the word, all the rest of y'all just kind of attend. When the word of God says we are a royal priesthood, we are a holy generation. And when that began to happen, the fivefold started going out of the window. The apostle, the prophet, the teacher, come on, the pastor and the evangelist. And we raised up the priest. And now the priest was in charge of everything. Just as God gave Moses the heavenly design of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, said, if you build it the way I tell you, my glory will come. And he did, and the glory came. God gave Paul a picture of the end times tabernacle. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. God is raising up the body in the fivefold. And the end times remnant, the end times remnant church is a fivefold church. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. See, God wants to tear down the pastor who people think he's everything and he thinks he's everything. <laughs> Can I get real honest? We've gone from worshiping Jesus to worshiping personalities. That's the problem. That's the problem. We worship personalities. The world does it with, with movie stars and with athletes and with musicians. The church does it with pastors. And I've talked to folks before and I'll ask people, oh, what church do you go to? I go to Pastor So-and-So's church. Don't you dare do that with me. Don't you dare do that with me. You don't go to my church. You go to the Lord's church. And don't identify this church with me. Identify this church with Jesus. We've made the pastor a rock star. And that was never the heart of God. The heart of God was apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists working together in the fivefold. The apostolic father raising each of the folds up. There's Psalm 133 unity, and it's beautiful and it's powerful. Can I hear an amen? amen. See, the, the end times church is, is fivefold. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Amen. So the Lord said with Constantine, there were pagan practices intertwined with Scripture, and it brought a mixture that hindered things. You know what we're doing today? 2,000 years later, we're dealing with the same religious system. And God says, I'm striking it down! And I'm raising up a remnant. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yeah. So what's God doing right now? God's expanding. Two things are happening right now. And mark these words because I believe they're from the Holy Spirit. God is beginning to expose the Babylonian religious system. Yes. And he's saying it's over. Yes. You're about to see ministers and ministries dismantled. Yes. And it will shock the world as much as it will shock the church. Because the Lord is saying, I am now uprooting the unfruitful fig tree. I asked God, I asked the Lord Jesus one day, I said, why did you curse the fig tree? That seemed very unjesus like <laughs> There's this innocent little fig tree, green and leafy, but no figs. And the Lord curses the thing and it dies from the roots up immediately. Right. Why would he do that? I heard the Lord say, because I hate things that look one way, but they're really another. Wow. He said, and it was green leafy in the season for figs, but it had no figs, and I cursed it. God says, I'm about to dismantle ministries that look green and leafy and fruitful, but they're barren to me. They're barren because they're Babylonian, and the Lord says, I'm tearing them down. So what is God doing? He doesn't tear down unless he's building up. Can I hear an amen? amen? So what's God doing? He's calling out a forerunner group of believers totally in love with him that are going to do things his way. Yes. He's calling out a group of forerunner believers totally in love with him that are going to do things his way. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Does anybody receive that Lord? Okay, now how many people when I just said that felt a stirring in their hearts? If you felt a stirring in your heart, then you're a part of that group. One of the biggest reasons why Jesus called the religious people of his day vipers and whitewashed tombs was because they wanted to hold on to the system that they'd always known instead of laying a hold of Yeshua who was right in front of them. 
And the Lord is saying, let go of the system and lay hold of me. Because the bride of Christ was never meant to belong to a system. She belongs to the bridegroom. And we've got to understand that. That's why church as we know it is about to completely change. Church as we know it is about to completely change. You can either embrace the familiar or you can lay hold of the hem of his garment and not let go. And the challenge is for most of us, we don't like change, even when it's God initiated. God says you're either going to lay hold of my change or you're going to be left behind. And I want to encourage you, don't be left behind. That's not a message of condemnation. It's an invitation from God to lay hold of what he's doing. There's been a generation that's laid a hold of his garment and let go when they've got the healing they needed. God says, I'm raising up a generation that will lay hold of the hem of my garment and not let go. Because they realize I'm their everything. And without me, they can do nothing. Do you receive this in the Lord? Amen. Do you receive this in the Lord? Yes. See, this is what we have to understand about them. They want the acceptance of God more than the acceptance of their peers. They want the love of God more than they want the love of their peers. They want the will of God more than they want the will of their peers, their family, and everybody else around them. See, the true remnant church is going to look like nothing the world has ever seen before. Has anybody received that? Amen. So here's the thing. We've all got our own Babylonian system within our hearts. And God wants to remove it. What did he say to, to Israel? He said, I'm going to remove your hearts of stone. And I'm going to give you in its place a heart of flesh. He says, I'm going to take your ashes and I'm going to give you my beauty. Can I be this bold and say, I'm going to take the system out of you. And I'm going to give you intimacy. And when that happens, you're going to wonder how you ever lived in the system. Does that make sense? See, the New Testament church was organic. It was growing every day. It was powerful. It wasn't associated with the building. It wasn't associated with a pastor. Paul even had to say to some of his churches at one point, stop saying I belong to Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of this and I'm of that. Be of Jesus. I mean, he was dealing with that mindset even back then. You belong to the Lord. You may attend the refuge, but you're His. Amen? Hallelujah. And the church is meeting right now. But when we go out the door, this is an empty building. Other than the amazing presence of God that we see. But we leave a building carrying the articles of the Lord and we go out into a lost and dying world where people are captive to the prince of this world and we show them that there's a prince of peace. We show them that there's a risen king. We show them that there's a God who loves them and wants to transform their life. It's not religious. It's not, hey, come to my church. It's, hey, come to my Jesus. Yes. If you need a place to go, we got one, but let's come to Jesus. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. I am thrilled you're here today. Please come back next week. I love you. I'm excited about what God's doing here. But my heart is the king and his kingdom. And if I focus on the king and his kingdom, he will build this. Because unless the Lord builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. How many receive that in the Lord? Somebody excited about the Lord? Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Pastor, send me Galatians 5.1, please. Galatians 5.1. God wants us to understand this. God's not interested in a religious storehouse. He's interested in relational reality. Does that make sense? 
Even in Jesus' day, they're walking with Jesus by the temple and they're just marveling. They're marveling while, while Yeshua is right next to them. They're marveling at the beauty of the building and, and Solomon's architecture and all of this. They're, they're marveling and the one who is the temple is standing next to them. And so many times today people marvel at the religious storehouse. Wow, look at this building. Look at this rock star pastor. Look at this incredible praise and worship team. Look at this, look at this. And they don't realize they're attending theater. They're not attending a house of intimacy. Give me a leaky warehouse and radical messianic believers. This is the battle cry of the end times church. It's for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The Babylonian system is a yoke of slavery. Freedom is being able to do what Holy Spirit wants us to do whenever Holy Spirit wants us to do it. So the true end times church, when we're here in the house, we ask, Holy Spirit, what are you doing today? And whatever Holy Spirit is doing, we do it. And the days are coming where Holy Spirit may say something that we don't quite understand or maybe aren't quite comfortable with. Like, Holy Spirit, what are you doing today? Well, right now I'm in the park across the street from the church, and I want you to take the entire body and a couple of guitars, and I want you to praise and worship out there so the neighborhood can see it. And then I want you to go minister to people in the neighborhood. Oh, but wait a minute, God, it's Sunday morning. We don't do that Sunday morning. Sunday morning we do praise and worship, and, and, and then we do the Word, and then we do body, body ministry, and, and, and folks, you know, hug, and it's wonderful, and then they go home. See, there's a system everywhere. And even here where we have freedom, we can have a system in our hearts. And God says the system is the enemy of what I want to do. Give me the system and let me author what I want to do in this house. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm learning how to do this. I'm learning how to do this. Does that make sense? I mean, we are right in the middle of praise and transitioning into worship, and God gives Chad a word that's burning on his heart to deliver right then and there. In the old days, I'd have been like, hey, brother, there's a time for this, and I'll let you know when. But this is not the old days anymore. God wanted it delivered. He is the word. The word knows when the word should be delivered. And my responsibility is to say, yes, Lord. I didn't even ask Chad what the word was because spirit recognizes spirit. And I know he's going to get up here and say what God says. Was that not an awesome word from the Lord? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when it was done, I'm like, man, that just perfectly tied everything together and ministered to people and set the tone for where we were going next. How many, knows, how many know God knows how it's supposed to be done? But we've been taught... Three songs, an offering, two songs, a quick word, closing churches, in by 12, and we go home. That is a Babylonian system. That's not the church. I must say that in love. It's not. It's not. The church is so organic in the Holy Spirit and free in the Holy Spirit and powerful and anointed. But yet we also understand that the Holy Spirit, there's order in his freedom. Right. And there's freedom in disorder. See, when we're submitted to Holy Spirit, nothing weird is going to happen. It's going to be really good. And people are going to come here, and if they've got a remnant heart, the first time they come, they're going to go, yeah, this is for me. And if they don't have a remnant heart, they're going to go, where's the nearest exit? And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. But they're, if they look for the nearest exit, they're not trying to exit us. They're exiting what God wants to do. And we need to pray for them. And we need to love on them. Because anybody, any church person that God has us minister to that's in the system, 
God wants to give them the freedom that He's given us, and we were once them. Does that make sense? Woo! You go for it. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a lot more fun God's way anyway. Amen? It's a lot more fun God's way anyway. See, Paul ushered into the church a freedom. It wasn't law-based. It was Spirit of God-based because Paul understood the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And the church is supposed to be full of life, not law. But law makes us feel comfortable because we know what to expect. The Holy Spirit doesn't always make us feel comfortable because we don't always know what to expect, do we, Brother Neville? In fact, in the end time church, you're going to less know what to expect than ever before. Because God's doing a thing we've never seen before. Study Azusa Street, you may see a little bit of a glimpse. Because we're going to see greater than Azusa. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Amen? Hallelujah. So what is God saying? He's saying, I am doing a new thing in the earth today. He's saying, I declare a new beginning. Who's coming with me? Who's coming with me? And I want to encourage you in your heart today to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let's go. God, I want to do this thing. And for us to take the hands of the Holy Spirit and just be led. See, those that are of, of the Spirit, <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Those that are of the Lord are, are and of the Spirit are like the wind. <laughs> See, the winds of the Holy Spirit are about to blow like never before. <laughs> and the heads of wheat will bow down in the wind, and the tears will stand straight up. God is saying, I want you to surrender to the winds of my Spirit. And I want you to move in what I called you to move in in this hour. The Lord says, don't resist me. He says, surrender to me. Don't resist me. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't resist me. Because I want to do something in you that you've never seen me do before. I want to do something in the earth that you've never seen me do before. I'm convinced the end times church's greatest ministry will be outside of the four walls. Yes. We'll just celebrate it all in here. But the greatest work will be out there. Jesus went to temple on Sabbath. But his ministry, true ministry, was outside the four walls. See, we've got to understand he's the template and that's our template. We, we come to the house on the Sabbath, so to speak. But our true ministry goes on all week long. And we celebrate that when we get here as we minister to the Lord. Yes. That's the heart of the remnant church. That's part one of what God's given me for this message. Part two is going to come tonight. So I want to encourage you to either tune in tonight to the broadcast or come to Kelly Road tonight at 5 o'clock. Pastor Cindy can give you directions. But more than any of that... I want to encourage you, lay hold of this message God gave today. Lay hold of it and let it burn within you until you have to let it out. I'm so convinced. End Times ministry looks so different than anything we've ever seen before. I, I told the group this last week, but there's some that, that weren't here that I want to hear this. I'm walking with my family on a bike path last week and we went when I felt like we were supposed to go and we come to this intersection on the pathway and here's a young man walking by himself and the Lord said go up to him and, and say what do you do when you find yourself in a place in life where you're not where you thought you would be never met the man in my life and I walked up to him and I said that and he just stops and looks at me. He said, it's funny you say that. I came to the forest preserve to kill myself tonight. He said, I had a fight with my fiance. I'm, I'm drunk. And he said, I came to kill myself tonight. And I just shared the Lord with him. And the Lord allowed me just to hold on to him while he wept. And just to love on him and 
minister to him. He'd been churched and found himself in that place. Wow. And God just touched his life and, and his fiance sent a, just a neat text um, that Monday evening just saying how he felt the love of God like never in his life in that encounter. That didn't happen inside the church. That happened because the church was being the church. I was part of it and God was moving the way he wanted to move. In the past, man, you look like you're hurt. And I pastor a great church, man. Here's here it is, and here's when it starts. That's not what he needed. He needed Jesus on the bike path. Yes. God will plug him into the right house. He needed Jesus on the bike path. And God says, I want to break us out of this mentality of handing out our church cards and into the mentality of handing out Jesus. Yes. Because we love to minister to him and because we've done that, we've begun to love what he loves. And so we can just flow in the love of God to anybody God puts in our pathway, even somebody that smells like a distillery and is hurting so desperately. I tell you what, he not only felt the love of God in a profound way, I did too. As I held on to him and just loved on him. See, God's not a ministry for you. And it's unique, and it's awesome, and it's powerful. Do you believe that? See, Amen. God's got a ministry for you. Yeah. Come here, <laughs> I won't embarrass you purposely. God does. <laughs> God is doing a move in your generation. And God says, I'm raising up men and women in this generation that have made mistakes that nobody else would choose. God says, I'm choosing them. And the Lord says, you're one of them. Yes. The Lord says, you have marks and you have scars. But Jesus says, I have them too. And I have them for your sake. The Lord says, now can I pour out myself through you to a lost and dying world? And I'm going to be real frank with you. God wants to bring revival to the black community. And God is raising up young black men and black women and those that are older too that he's doing a mighty work through. He's saying, I have given the arts to the black community. He says, now the black community is going to use those arts for me. And those arts are going to catch the hearts of people. And everything's going to change. Wow, I just feel the Holy Spirit like electricity just flowing right Hey! Now. Whoa. The Lord says to you, have I not called you? Have I not chosen you? The Lord says, don't think that mistakes disqualify you. The Lord says, I don't see mistakes. I see victories in the making. He says, I don't see failures. He says, I see I'm raising you up for greater things. He says, these hands... I'm going to heal the sick and raise the dead. Yeah. The Lord says you don't have to look for love in the wrong places anymore. The Lord says that He is the love that you so desperately need. And the Lord says that if you'll just surrender yourself to His love, that other love you're looking for, He's got to cover. He says He's got to cover. He says, you are of such great worth and such great value. Yes. He says, the things in life that have happened haven't told you that. But he says, you're his beautiful daughter. Yes. And he says, he wants you to wait for his best. He says, he has things for you that you never imagined. And he says, I am going to bring those things forth from you if you will let me. God says, I'm going to do miracles through you. God says, I touch the generations in your family before you so that I can get to you, God says. You've been my target for generations. I see a mighty woman of faith standing up and ministering in streets, ministering in the house of God, ministering throughout the earth. I see a woman of destiny in front of me is what I see. 
the Lord says the battle is whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Lord's report? Or are you going to believe the report of your past? God says the way things have been in your life, I'm going to change them. You saw things and said, God, when is this going to change? When are you going to do this? When are you going to move in that? God says, I'm doing it. He says, I'm doing it right now. He says, even when you leave this house, you're going to find that I've been moving in some areas. He says, trust me. 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 Why don't you stand right here for a moment, won't you, God? Holly, would you just come and stand behind this young lady for a moment for prayer, for prayer support? And just put your hands towards her, if you would. I hear the Lord saying, I'm pouring out a fresh anointing on you today. The Lord says, I am pouring out a fresh anointing. He says, you searched and you wandered, Lord said, but I've never let go of you. And the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth says to you this morning, I want to show you that I'm not just a prophet. I'm a prophet, priest, and king. He says, I want to show you I chose you before you were ever born. And the Lord says, I want to show you that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I want to show you how much I love you. The Lord says, all I want you to do is receive. That's all you need to do. Hallelujah. What's your name? Pardon? Jalea. With a J? Yeah. What's that mean? <laughs> okay, we're going to find out. You know, God knows. God knows. You know, it's interesting you got a butterfly on your back. You got eagle's wings on your back too. Yes. The, Lord says, yes. the Lord says you're gonna soar like an eagle. Yes. I hear the Lord also saying to you, there's some attachments to you that He says I want to begin to break off. And some of those are to people. Yes. And the Lord says I want to disconnect those. Will you let me? Yes. Because the Lord says I never take without giving more back. The Lord says, I don't take the power you see necklace unless I've got a strand of pearls for you. The Lord says, I need to disconnect some things from you. Will you let me? Okay. And Julia, just, just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. I give my life to you. And I trust you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I give you permission to break the chains, to cut the cords, and to remove from my life anything that you want to. Because I understand that you have so much more for me. I trust you, Jesus. Help me trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, I just covered Julia in your blood right now. Let me just say, Lord Jesus, I break every covenant, every agreement that I've made with anything and anyone but you. And I receive the fullness of the new covenant in your blood, in Jesus' name. Lord, detach me from anything that's not of you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would touch this young lady. I ask Holy Spirit that you would fill her with the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Spirit of counsel, might, and knowledge. Lord, I ask that you would fill her with the apostolic anointing, the prophetic anointing, the preaching anointing. 
the teaching anointing and the, in the, in the evangelistic anointing. Lord, I ask that you would fill her with love, joy, peace, generous, goodness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that she would feel your presence and that the glory of the Lord would come forth upon this woman of God. Lord, I ask that an anointing will come over her hands right now. Lord, an anointing that when she sees the sick will bring a burning to these hands to lay these hands upon the sick and see them healed. Lord, I ask right now that you would circumcise her hearts. And Lord, that you would remove anything and anyone from her heart that's not of you. Lord, I declare she will not walk like Old Testament Israel that worship Jehovah and other gods. But Lord, I declare she will worship the Lord her God. With all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, she will love him. Lord Jesus, right now I declare you are cutting every cord. And you are breaking every umbilical cord. And I command these yokes of the enemy to break off in the name of Jesus right now. In the name of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I declare right now you are yoking her with you. For your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Lord Jesus, I declare that Julia is a woman of destiny. And Lord, I declare she's going to fulfill your purpose in her generation. Lord Jesus, I bless her. I speak a life over her. Lord Jesus, I declare right now you are removing, you're doing holy surgery and removing things that are not of you. Lord Jesus, I ask, capture all of her hearts. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I stand in for her earthly dad right now. And Lord Jesus, I bless her. And I declare she's a beautiful dad, or a beautiful daughter that any dad would love to have as his own. And Lord, as I stand in for her dad, I just bless her. And I declare you're free to be everything that the Lord Jesus Christ and Master you. And I declare God is putting over you with an amazing mothering and anointing for your daughter. I declare God is anointing you with that anointing to fill the gap in her life. And I declare in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, has a beautiful, godly husband for you. And I declare you're going to get so lost in Jesus that when he comes, he's going to have to go through Jesus to get to you. And so I just bless you in the name of Jesus right now. I declare every word curse that's ever been spoken against you is broken through the blood of Jesus. I declare every lie that your generation has believed is broken in Jesus' name. And I just come against that lie that Jesus does things for everybody but you. And I speak that's broken in Jesus' name right now. Because you're a beautiful daughter of the King. And I bless you right now. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would release your love over her. gray-haired saints. And, and I joke that, that this was the power corner. But there's a reality in what I was saying. Because God is saying right now to the older generation, your ministry is just beginning. The Lord says your ministry to me and to my people is only just beginning. The word says that with gray hair comes wisdom. And God is raising up his gray-haired saints for their greatest hour. So I, I, the Lord's been talking a lot about the youth today, but gray-haired saints, God has so much for you. Amen. Now some are 
gray hair and saints cover the gray. Amen. And so God's talking to you too. I want you to know that. Hallelujah. I mean, God's talking to Miss Clairol's in this room right now. All right? But God says, I saved the best wine for last. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yeah. Amen. So I want to encourage you right now. Just put a hand up before the Lord. I just declare over you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth that you're the head and not the tail. That you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I declare over you that you're coming and not going. <laughs> I declare over you that the best days the Lord has for you are yet ahead. I declare over you that every word and curse that's ever been spoken against you is broken through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I declare over you every negative word that you've ever spoken against yourself is broken in Jesus' name. I decree over you in the name of Jesus that you will not nullify God's breakthrough through the words that you're speaking with your mouth. But I declare rather you're going to agree with God for the breakthrough that He has for your life. I declare over you right now impossible situations are shifting in your life. I declare over you right now things that need to change that haven't seen the change are changing. I declare the Lord is the irresistible force that's meeting the immovable objects in your life and He's moving them out of the way. I declare everything in your family line that's hindered you from intimacy with Jesus is being broken right now through the blood of the Lamb. Any of you that had ancestors that were in the daughters of the Eastern Star, the Masons, the Illuminati, any secret societies, Shriners and others, I did Templars, I declare God is breaking their oaths and vows that they took that came through the family line. God's breaking that right now. I declare God is breaking the spirit of Catholicism off of people in this house right now. He's breaking the spirit of universalism, the spirit of Constantinism off of this house in the name of Jesus right now. I declare God's going all the way back in your family line and He's breaking the curses that came from the geographical areas that your ancestors came from. I declare God is breaking Middle Eastern curses. God is breaking Eastern European curses. God is breaking Jamaican curses. Because Jamaica's in the house. I declare God is breaking Caribbean and Haitian curses. In the name of Jesus right now. I declare God is breaking slavery curses right now. In this house in the name of Jesus. He's breaking mindsets. I declare the Lord Jesus is breaking the mindset of poverty off of people in this house. Yes, chains are dropping, shackles are coming to the ground. I declare yokes are breaking in this house because our God is the yoke breaker and the miracle maker. I declare Holy Spirit right now is stirring a fire in you. And everything is changing. And I declare you're coming into the greatest intimacy with Jesus that you've ever had before. And I declare those of you that have been in ministry in the past, and right now you're in an interim season, the Lord is saying for you, I'm working in you in this season. I'm repairing the foundation and I'm building the walls. The Lord says you will minister again. You're not forsaken and you're not forgotten. My timing is perfect, but this season of foundation is crucial because I'm building the foundation the right way. You've been taught man's way. Now I'm going to teach you my way. And when you learn my way, I will use you to build a highway, the Lord says. The highway to the Lord. I declare right now God is tearing down the mountains in your life. And God is making the low places high. And I declare over you right now that the Lord is bringing you into a season of greater revelation in John 15. I declare that He is the vine and you are the branches. And Holy Spirit is teaching you how to abide in Jesus. I declare you are fruitful branches connected to the vine. And you will thrive in the soil God has put you in. You will drink from the well that God has now said is yours. And you will bear fruit even into, even into your old age. And every part of you 
will be usable. So I bless you and I bless your ministry to Jesus right now in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. I heard Holy Spirit say, let me work some more. Hallelujah. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment and just listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. Just listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. Natasha, is God giving you a word to release it all? Yes, that's great. Let me bring you over here. That's okay. So folks online, you can hear. That way Pastor Cindy won't give me a hard look from the booth. Hallelujah. Right, Pastor Cindy? No. <laughs> Uh -huh. testing, testing one, two, three. All right, well, God, I'm going to ask you to come over here. All right, I thought I saw the word purpley over there. Yeah. I am so overwhelmed in like the best way possible. When Pastor Andrew was talking, the Lord read me to Mark uh, 8, 814. And in there talks about uh, Jesus uh, warns the, his disciples, his chosen people, about the religious and the law. He talks about them as uh, Pharisees. So I'll just go ahead and read it real quick. <laughs> I have to be obedient and release this, but I know that a lot of it's for me too, from my background, and things that God's freed me from. And even though in the beginning it seemed very difficult, and now that I see where I am and then where I was, only He could do it. And I think He does these things in increments to really boost our faith, to yeah. recognize that. No matter what the obstacle looks like, yes, it's a mountain, but you have the word and the power to remove it. And the system of religion can be, I believe enemy doesn't really care. You know, he, he's more concerned about the remnant, the ones that are hungry, yes. the ones that hear the word in a really tangible way. Those are the, you know, that's, that's the ammunition in the kingdom. So uh, eight fourteen says the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, "It is because we have no bread." Now, mind you, just before that, Jesus fed the four thousand. So they saw this awesome miracle God did right in front of their eyes. Yet they were worried because they weren't going to have enough in the future. And so Jesus' heart here is saying, be careful of the religious, the problems that come to you. Uh, if you agree with them, then you're in violation of what God's created you for. So this ties into the message. And again, a lot of this, I think, is just for me as well to really like masticate on and grasp just how big and how awesome the Lord is. And being a part of the remnant like this, the Herald, I believe, um, talks about the humanism. And I believe to present the just system that made God the center of his impersonal, distant nature, which is not true at all. So I just want to, I guess, encourage and say this, that when we leave here, really this really are just walls, but we are so loved by God that the motive and the goal is when people see us that they see Him. Yes. That they see our fruit and it takes time and it takes us to work our salvation out, but I, I promise you, like, if you just ask, He will receive. And if you not, He will open. He wants it more than you want it. So I just want to bless you guys. Um, we're all going through our own things, but God's faithful. And if he says something to you, hold on to that and say, Lord, you've spoken this. And then it comes into fruition. So I love you guys. Bless you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Do you receive that word in the Lord? Yeah. God's been releasing awesome words on this place. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we just bless your name. Lord, I thank you for everything you've done in this place today. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you don't just do things. You're doing things, Lord God. So, Lord, what you've done in this place is going to carry on with us, Lord God. And Holy Spirit, we just receive that right now. Holy Spirit, I ask God, may this word from this morning be burnt upon our hearts, God. Lord, may it burn within us. And Lord, as you've been having me speak again, again, and again, Lord, about what the end times church looks like, God, I pray that you will help us become, Lord, part of your end times church. Lord, you said this house would be a prototype of what you want the end times church to look like. And others would come to see what you do here and take part of that with them like Azusa Street. Lord, I ask that you will birth greater than Azusa Street Revival. Lord, in the hearts of everybody in this room and everybody listening in and everybody that's going to listen to the broadcast throughout this week. Lord, I just speak life over this house and over this group. Lord, may you release your Zoe over us, Lord God. Your so-so. Lord, I just bless this group now in your name. Lord Jesus, I ask for an amazing week for this group of breakthroughs. Lord, an amazing week of you moving in a powerful way. And Lord, I ask that even if the enemy tries to move up to try to hinder what you've done today, Lord, we just declare towards him that no weapon formed against us is going to prevail. And every tongue that comes against us, we will refute, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And vindication from me declares the Lord God Almighty. Lord, I just bless this group right now. God, I thank you for everything that you're about to do this week. Lord, I ask for divine appointments this week for everybody in this house. Lord, that this house would flow in evangelistic anointing. Lord, to see people saved every week. Lord God. And Lord, may you fill this house with baby Christians that need to be discipled and raised up in what you have for them, God. Lord, give us a sickle for the end times harvest. Lord, give us a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. And Lord, help us understand your calling in these times, the end times. Lord, help us be a part of your remnant church. And Lord Jesus, we pray this now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill this group with the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of light and the spirit of knowledge. Lord, fill us with your Iscus power, your Junimos power, your Kratos power, your excusi authority and ridiculous favor like a shield. Lord, I speak your ridiculous favor over everyone, everyone in this house. And Lord, I pray God, may you fill us with your glory anointing the glory light of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, may the Son of God rise over us with healing in his wings and his beams, and may we rise up like calves released from the stall. And Lord Jesus, we pray this in your precious name. For you're the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. I just pray now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom and peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Um, you right? Um, when we were praying for you, I kept hearing God is gracious. At first, I, I looked up Janelle. I was like, how do I spell her name? I'm gonna spell. But that meant God is gracious. So when I looked up your name, because Andrew didn't know it, you didn't know it, and God wanted to bless you from the whole family of God, it's usually a reverence from Arabic, but it's also Hebrew. Our Christian religion is mainly for girls, name as well. And the uh, alias in the Hebrew means a sense, like a like ascending or a smell. And the job beginning often con connotes God, meaning basically his sense, and that God is gracious. And it's basically uh, meaning a form of Jane, which is a female form of John, and means God is gracious. And how I know that is because my mate and my name is John, and so I was interested, it's like it was uh, like. Helping you know we in the J clan, so I want to say, God bless you.
Oh, hallelujah. Before we go, Rosie, you painted for us today. What is the prophetic meaning of your painting? So, um, I just want to thank you guys first for allowing me to do this because it, it's definitely fun for me. Um, I've always liked drawing and painting. Um, I, I got it from my dad, who's very artistic in many different ways. And I also, I, I like to say I also got it from my older sister, too, because as I started watching my dad draw, do artistic things, and watching my sister do art like throughout high school and middle school, I just started having passion for it because I saw my family do it, and I they're they're the reason why like I started doing this. Especially my mom, she she's an artistic too. She may say that she's not, but I think she is. So um, thank you uh, for yielding. She's not to here that. in this room right now. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So, um, but I I I believe like my my whole entire family is artistic in their own way, and I just. Thank God for giving me that kid, yes. <laughs> because yes. otherwise I don't know what I'd be doing right now. Okay. But um, so God, God gave me this vision, and it's very rare when I get visions because usually I get these crazy dreams. Okay. So thank you, Jesus, for this. Um, but as I was painting, God gave me this vision, and I was standing in this room, and I saw. A fiery furnace, and it reminded me of you know ne Nebuchadnezzar. I, I, I'm sure it was Nebuchadnezzar, and um, with the three men put in the fire, and then you know he saw four men really. Yes. But this was wow. this was different in a way, and I I knew that I was in that um, story, that memory in, in the Bible because I saw that fiery furnace. I was sitting right there, I saw Nebuchadnezzar, I saw a group of people surrounding behind me, like in a half circle, and everyone was just groaning, just, just upset, just mad, and um, they pulled this person out of the group, and they're just weeping, they're screaming, they're crying, saying, Lord Jesus, help me, help me, help me, and I see these guards or soldiers just pushing them into the fiery furnace and I'm just sitting there watching and I can't do anything, I can't speak, I can't say anything at that moment because otherwise if I could I'd go in there and save that person. And they close the door and they go back to the group of people and I see this man standing over next to the fiery furnace about to you know, light it up and I'm just sitting there and I'm watching, the guy's trying to light it up but he can't. And I'm just looking over at Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm just saying, dude, your plan isn't working. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but it's not working. <laughs> the thing isn't lighting up. But um, the man kept doing it, kept doing it, but it wouldn't work. And Nebuchadnezzar just said, you know, okay, let's, let's just go home. Obviously, this isn't working. We'll just leave the man in here. And I felt my body starting to turn, and we started walking. But all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I could see... A light coming out of the fiery furnace and I thought okay the fire is working apparently but it wasn't the fire it was actual light coming out so I go up to the door and I look through the window through the door and I see the person standing right there and I see another man in there and I knew that was God right away I, I had that feeling I knew it was God I look over at the people I say I see another man in the furnace I see I see someone in that light right there and the man who was supposed to light the fire and failed miserably, he told me I, I didn't even light the fire yet. I didn't I didn't do anything yet. And I said, That's God's light shining through. I said, That is God. That is the man that you put in there, and that is also God. And as I was sitting there watching um, God just putting his arm around the um, person's shoulders, they begin to walk further and further into the fiery furnace. And the man that they placed in that fiery furnace started turning into a tree. And then that's when the door started opening and God walked out of the furnace and told the people to go in. So all the people started going in except for Nebuchadnezzar, obviously. And everyone started going in and they all started turning into these seeds, which I thought was really weird and creepy. And God just picked up all the seeds and as I stepped into the furnace, I was looking around, I see these holes in the ground. And it was soil, so 
I, I'm, I'm assuming it was soil, dirt, or whatever you call it. And God started placing the seeds in the ground and started covering the, the seeds with more dirt. And then I started seeing more trees growing, wow. more trees growing. But then I turn around, I see all of these seeds that didn't turn into trees. And that's when I thought, okay, Lord, I said, these people didn't turn into trees, but why did these people turn into trees? And as I was saying that in my mind, I looked at the trees and I noticed that these trees were different from that one tree, that, that first tree that was grown by that man that they put in the furnace. And I saw that the tree had fruit on it, it was beautiful, but there was something about it that just seemed very, very off. And I looked at the other trees, they were just normal trees, you know, those trees that you probably don't even want. They didn't grow anything. But there was something special about those trees, even though they didn't look the best on the outside, I just knew that there was something about it that was just beautiful, that was just wonderful. And even with this message, um, I think it was Pastor Andrew who said this, that um, I, I can't I can't remember when it was. It was either like just this this message or it was messages before saying that on the outside something is beautiful. Like you, you want it, you, you you want this specific tree because it's so beautiful. Like it's growing flowers, it's going growing fruits, it's growing everything that you were hoping for, but on the inside it's it's just something ugly, something that you're, you're not wanting. Like the Garden of Eden, for example, that tree. That tree, if it was cursed, like if, if you eat from that tree, then you will surely die. That's what it says in the Bible. And at Adam and Eve, they, they surely did die. Obviously, they're not alive right now, but <laughs> it's, it's true. But um, they ate from the tree. They, they realized that, oh, I'm naked. I need clothes, God provided them those clothes because even though they they sinned they didn't listen to God God provided that for them and out of that what I got out of that is even though those trees just didn't seem all that great they were just plain old trees on the inside they they're probably still growing they're probably still developing those beautiful things but we just don't see it on the outside because what we see on the outside is totally different from what God sees on the inside. And that's how that's how we are. We might see things in the mirror. We might see like, oh, I'm, uh, I, I have this growing on my face or um, something's wrong with my hair. I need to go get a trim or something or I'm not pretty. I'm not handsome or blah, 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 all, all these stuff. But God sees more in us than we see in ourselves because we we were born on this earth. We will think fleshly things, like that's that's just how we are because of those things that happened with Adam and Eve. Because of those things, because the sin was brought onto this world because of that situation, we began thinking those fleshly thoughts, with, which aren't of God. We must not add, and God. God is up there or here right now saying whatever you're thinking right now that is not true that is not of me I see yes. so many things in you especially with these trees with these people who grew into those into those trees I planted those seeds I planted you here for a specific reason and that reason is to just grow into that tree that I want you to be and so instead of creating that beautiful tree that we all know and love and want. Um, I just painted a tree that we are on the outside, but on the inside, you know, we'll, we'll start we'll start growing. We'll start growing those those fruits, those beautiful flowers, like how we were supposed to be. Yay. Um, to go with it. So, so with the light, when I saw the light coming out of the furnace, um, God brought this verse to me. It's Matthew 5, verse 4, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people 
light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And then another verse I um, got from God was Psalms 1, 3. And it was about the trees. Um, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And also in Ezekiel 31, verse 9, this was talking about um, Eden. I made it beautiful with the multitude of its branches, and all the trees of Eden, which were in the garden of God, were jealous of it. So like I said about those people, a group of people that were standing behind me who, who ended up turning into trees, well, most of them did. All those people, they were all, you know, complaining, saying, God, um, why, why am I not like this tree? Why am I not like this person or whatever? They all, they all turned into these, you know, plain looking trees, but then that's when they realized, oh, I have so much more to offer. Like, I, I really am important. I really am worthy. Um, I, I really am beautiful, and I really am handsome, talented, and blessed. Well, this tree over here, this person, there, there's so much more going on, on on the inside, but but they're so beautiful on the outside. Like, how is that possible? And I really, I, I really think that's a testimony for me. I don't know about you guys, but that that's a testimony for me because I had I had times and days like in my past where I thought. You know, I, I really don't think I'm, I'm worth it. Like, am I really? Am I really talented? Like, can I do this? Can I do that? And am I really blessed, God? But I, I, I really don't think I am, God. And I started becoming very insecure of myself because of the world that I was around me, because, um, because of the people that I was around, because of the friends I was with. Um, thank goodness, not for family, but a, a lot of people can say that they experience the same thing like that's everybody's testimony that's not just mine and people may say that's not my testimony i've never felt that way at some point you probably have and um i i, I can't speak for you but i can't say that everybody has had one thought in their mind that oh i i'm not worth it god like i i don't know why you're telling me i'm this beautiful tree on the inside but obviously i'm not on the outside but yeah god gave me gave me this this morning just just as a testimony to me but not only to me but also to you guys as well thank you we just love rosie and the lord don't we yes. Yes. just a blessing from him thank you rosie yes. hallelujah well, i want to thank you for coming today god bless you i want to remind everybody we're probably around tonight at five o'clock I'm just so thankful we came and enjoyed the Lord today. Love the presence of the Lord, just incredible yeah. in this place. Wow, yes. hallelujah. Yes. Well, God bless you. You have a great week in the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes.